Welcome, everybody, to Dead Talk Live. And tonight, we have a very special guest, Juliana Harkavy from Arrow, from uh, Last Shift, from so many, and The Walking Dead. Let's not forget about The Walking Dead. How are you doing, Juliana? So happy to be here. Uh, we are happy to have you with us. And we have a lot of questions. So let's just get started with probably what's been the biz- biggest project of your career up to now, and that's Arrow. Uh, just how did you get involved to become the, you know, the latest Black Canary? Yeah, it was um, it was a trip. I had just moved back to California after living in Florida for almost a decade. And um, I'd grown up in L.A. and I had started acting when I was younger, but took a hiatus, went to Florida. Um, and about three months after moving back, got the Arrow audition. And they didn't say anything about what the role was. They said it was like a rookie cop or vigilante, but they didn't give any specifics. And um, sometimes as an actor, you just go in the room and something happens. Like you realize the term chemistry between, you know, between acting partners or in a scene. It's not just like, it's a real thing. There's like an energetic thing that can happen, but it's this little magic moment that um, when it does happen, it's like lightning strikes. and that happened in the audition and just something clicked and I walked out of the room and I just said, wow, if I get a call back for this, I'm going to get the job and I have to be prepared. Um, and sure enough, I got the call back and I knew going in, I just like, I knew, I don't know, the character just felt like me, like it was my story to tell. Um, so you only so, did a uh, one audition or did you have to do some callbacks? Two. Yeah. The call that I had a callback uh, with all of the network people um and casting directors and uh yeah everyone from the show so and and that again was just another one of those moments where everything just felt really serendipitous and really right and um um luckily they agreed and so we got the call (laughs) got the call like two days later and um nobody asked me if they wanted the job they said would you like to move to vancouver (laughs) and um and i said yeah sure and uh, then they told me, everybody was on the phone, Mark Guggenheim and Wendy Miracle were on the phone. And that's when they told me, uh, would you like to be the Black Canary? Wow. And and wow. that that was when I knew my life was going to change. Yes. Uh, so uh, did you have any knowledge of the DC comic universe of, uh, you know, the Black Canary, your character Dinah, any of that? Or did you like research it after the audition, after you got the part? When did you really dig deep into the character you're going to be playing? Well, I knew about I knew a lot about the DC universe because my dad, growing up, actually worked did some business with DC Comics, so I had exposure to the comics as a kid. Um, and then I also so random and funny the episodes of Walking Dead that I did were with Kirk Acevedo and Audrey Marie Anderson, who were in my episodes of The Walking Dead as well. Wow. Um, and and um, who played uh, Richard Dragon and um, Lila, of course, yeah. and Arrow. And uh, so because of them, I knew what Arrow was, and I had watched a few episodes because my friends were in it. Um, so I had some idea, but then once I, of course, once I got the role, I did more research. And when I realized how far back this character went and how many decades she has existed, then I really had my work cut out for me. Now, when you got the call and you got the role, did you realize you were going to be doing this for the next five years, four seasons of your life? God, no. I, no, I had no idea it was going to. I I mean, I was in Arrow longer than I was in college. (laughs) (laughs) I had no idea. I mean, at first I was not a series regular. I was a... um, was it just like a recurring I guess you'd say it was a recurring uh, with an option for series regular and you never you know you get so jaded in this business you, you never think anything's going to go through mm-hmm. when you land a job it's like a miracle and so I just thought yeah you know we'll see when we get there I didn't have any expectations so when they made the announcement the next year that we were in fact going to be series regulars like I I just couldn't I couldn't believe it and every year thereafter that they made that announcement I still couldn't believe it now you have been in you have a very diverse resume uh i assume i made the assumption before i asked you that previous question but i assume that arrow up to now has been the highlight of your career is that accurate to say for sure for sure you just when you're when you're playing a character for that long on one project for that long it becomes 
part of you. It becomes a family. It becomes, you know, part of your identity. Like that, that character is part of my story um, in my personal life now. And every character you play is to a degree, but when it's for that many years, uh, you just, it's like, it's like a real relationship with mm-hmm. any person. It's deeper. Now, uh, have you found people messaging you uh, being a female superhero on this TV, super popular TV show that you're an inspiration to them? And, you know, have you been getting messages or people stopping you on the street and just telling you about that? I have. And it's actually been the most rewarding part of this job. Um, because going in, you just think, oh, I'm going to play a superhero, and you don't realize sort of the the reach that it has and the meaning that it has um, in real life, like playing a superhero that stands for something, and especially a, a female superhero who's strong and who um, has overcome some really hard stuff. And, um, yeah, I mean, from from people and even young kids who are sick and who have, I've been able to get through whatever illness they're going through because of the show or because of something that Dinah said. I mean, it kind of takes me back every time I hear it, but um, there are a lot of people who have found their strength in that character. And interestingly, when they tell me their story and I, I kind of realize that the power that that character has, like it's not just on screen and, and that helped me actually find my own strength, like in my, in my own life yeah. from hearing stories. I- I can totally imagine how just exhilarating that must feel. Now, I believe I read in a previous interview that you've done that your version of the Black Canary, because there were several that came before you, wanted it. You wanted it to be more vigilante, revenge based. Um, mm-hmm. Did you do anything different so you can portray that to the audience to say, "Hey, this Black Canary has maybe a little bit motivations than." her predecessors. Yeah, I definitely, I didn't consciously say, okay, you know, Katie Lotz did this and Katie Cassidy did this, so I'm not going to do that. But I just, I just focused on her story and I made that the motivation for her behavior and her actions. And I, I didn't, I didn't try to match any characteristics of anybody else because she did have such a unique story. Um, And yeah, she did have a level of, I think, just kind of grit and just, not caring and like just this vigilante energy um, that I think the other canaries had too, but I, I felt it very strongly with Dinah. Yeah, I did too. I felt like your version, which was awesome, said, you know, it was like, I've got nothing left to lose. I've been through so much. Uh, I've got nothing left to lose. And that's how you approach the character of Black Canary, which, like I said, was pretty kick ass. Now, you have a dancer background. How important did that come in? I mean, how physically demanding was the role of Black Canary? And did your background come in handy? Did you do a lot of your own stunts? That's, uh, I did a, I did as many as I could safely. And then when it was come, time to jump off buildings and things like that, I, I handed it over. Um, but having a background in sports and dance, definitely helped i wish i had more of a background in martial arts honestly Um, (laughs) it's just the more that you know how to do the more you can do on the show and it's fun but yeah it's very physically demanding i there was which year was it oh the first year your uh see episode or season five the first episode i was the least out of the least in shape that i was for the entirety of my uh, time on arrow because i had just booked it i was so tired i got sick like you actually can't keep up with the schedule if you're not exercising regularly and eating right so it kind of forces you to take care of yourself wow uh now is it true that shooting of each season of arrow took a good 10 months out of the year 10 months yeah 10 months out of the year wow that's crazy i mean that's almost an entire year and you're spending it um and since You are a lead character on the show uh, after the first year, like, you know, you said earlier, you spent a lot of time on that set in front of that camera. Did you find yourself after a while saying, you know what, did you find yourself growing sick of the character or were you just really sad when the end came and you like felt like, you know, the, the, the character of Black Canary, you were saying goodbye to a friend? Wow. Yeah, I definitely 
I had a hard time saying goodbye. And I didn't know that when I did say goodbye, it was actually the last time because I thought there was going to be a spinoff. Yeah. And I kind of held it in my heart like, no, don't say goodbye. This isn't it. And we waited months before we found out that it wasn't happening. So I kind of said goodbye months later, uh, you know, quarantined just like in a different world than I was when I when I left Arrow. But um, I never got sick of playing her. And when they wrote the pilot, they crafted all of these elements to Dinah that they actually I really appreciate. They took a lot of my uh, input and a lot of my ideas and things that I had always dreamed about her being and doing. And they put it in her character for the pilot. So I was so excited to sing and uh, garden and like all of these random other aspects of Dinah that I thought she had. Um, now, now yeah. did uh, COVID have anything to do with uh, the spinoff not really happening? That's what we were told. We were told that programming just changed, networks changed. They were entertaining, uh, putting it on a different network uh, for a period of time and just trying to make it live. And I think they just, nobody knew what to do. There was nothing being produced. Exactly. And if we go back, and it's just 18 months ago, not even, uh, wow. the whole world of entertainment has changed uh, from movie theaters to home streaming do you think if it was just, uh, you know, streaming was as prolific, uh, sorry, prolific as it is now, just 18 months ago, it might have been a different outcome for that spinoff? You know, it's possible. It, it's possible. I think that um, we've had to all adapt. And even the way that we audition now is different. You know, you don't go into the room anymore. Um, and everything is from home. I think maybe if they had been equipped beforehand for something like that, it's possible. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think it, it's great. The whole world changed the way that we do everything changed. All right. Now let's go from uh, superhero ex cop to <laughs> rookie cop guarding a police station before that station shuts down. And of course, <laughs> we're talking about last shift. Last week, as our guest, we had uh, the director, Anthony de Blasi, here oh. with us. Yeah, yeah, he was here with us, and he knew you were coming on. He's like, I'm going to watch, so he might be watching now, or he will, he will be later on. Okay. Now, you carry that whole movie. It was a one-character movie. First of all, had you ever done outside of stage, I don't know if you've done much theater, but carried an entire film by yourself which is what you did in last shift not to that degree not to that degree where there, it was just one person no there was always at least moments of of other characters <laughs> and that there were in last shift too but it was yeah it was a a very big and very amazing load to carry <laughs> So, uh, since it is really, I mean, Joshua Michael, who was a guest of ours last year, uh, played uh, the head of the payment cult uh, and all that good stuff. A great movie. You did, again, a fantastic job. Because I would imagine, as an actor, it's not easy to carry the load of a full movie all by yourself. I mean, is it easier? Is it easier not having to work? that much with other people or is it like three times as hard having to you know burden the whole workload by yourself yeah wow well, you know i'd never thought i've never thought of it before like in that in that term uh, in these terms i think um in some ways for me personally it's easier because you're forced to focus sometimes when you're in a film and you like have to travel somewhere for you know 13 weeks and um, you have like five scenes like it's you're kind of all over the place like you're still kind of in your life you're still you're kind of in the movie life and like with this we had 10 days to shoot the entire movie it was like every single day all day long and I guess I work well under pressure because when you're when I'm forced to focus it's just like I don't know everything connects emotionally I felt more connected in this film it was easier to get to all the places um, you know, just for acting wise that I, that I needed to go. And, um, I, I loved it. I, I kind of wish more films were done that way where it's just like, okay, put your head down and go and you lift it up and you're like, what did we just create? <laughs> did you find, uh, 
you know, Anthony sharing his vision for each scene and for the whole movie? Did you guys uh, understand each other, what he wanted, and him appreciating what you were doing? Did you guys click well together on the set? So, well, again, it's it's just one of those chemistry things. Like, either you have it or you don't. And when you do have it, you just make magic. And it happens on its own. And Anthony and I just spoke the same language. Um, he's one of my favorite directors I've ever worked with. He's a brilliant director, and specifically for horror. He yeah. just he just gets it. And every script of his I've read since. We've tried to work together on some projects. And, like, things just haven't, you know, logistics haven't panned out. But I'm so eager to get back on his set. He's amazing. Um, he is a great guy. He's a great. I mean, I from what you heard and what I hear from other people say he's a, he, and I've seen his work. He's a great director. So, uh, what makes him such a good director? And I think he even mentioned this last week. He doesn't hand the whole story over to the viewer on a silver platter. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. l- making sure you understand every point. He wants to leave it up to uh, at least some of it up to viewer interpretation. With that in mind, the homeless person in the movie, we never really get an answer as to what his role is, who he is, is he real, is he fake? What is your opinion? I mean, did Anthony explain it to you or did he leave it up to your imagination to figure out who this guy, who this character was in the movie? You know, I'm trying to remember. So that character was played by Jay LaRose. He's is such a talented, talented actor. We've worked together on a few things. Um, I'm trying to recall if Anthony told me his take on it, but the cool thing about the way he directs is he he leaves it open to you. He's not pushing anything on you. He comes up with ideas and he shares them and you collaborate. And so what it was supposed to be, I don't quite remember, but in for in my mind, what helped me in the script and, and in the trajectory of the film was to think, uh, to believe that it was real because there was this line of like there's weird stuff happening but okay there's an abandoned police station there's like this guy in here um, you know that could happen but then at some points the line gets you know turns gray and, and I think that's where that movie is so good because you just kind of can't tell exactly and I uh, the way Anthony described it last week in the beginning of the movie when you walk in when officer Cohen walks into the station and the sergeant says turn around Anthony explained that to us is the sergeant wanted to see to make sure you didn't have a big hole in the back of your head basically to see that you were real and not one of the ghosts and I didn't even know I that. didn't realize so it cool. either. <laughs> Until he told me, because that never made any sense to me. Why would he tell you to turn around? But that that's how Anthony explained it. Uh, the sergeant wanted to make sure that you were a real person and not a spirit. I was blown away by it, too. I, that's I, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm kind of embarrassed that I didn't know that. <laughs> now, your character, Jessica, do you feel that your the character's loss of her dad in the movie made her more susceptible to the payment spirits and the cult in general? Wow. That's a really cool question. I think so because she was so in tune with her dad and she just, she wanted to be, you know, his, his second in command. And she, she looked up to him and she really, I I believe um, was connected to his story and how he died. And I think that she was, um, on an energetic level already deeply involved in everything that happens. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. Now you said it and Anthony said it, it took 10 days. Were you on the set? Like you guys were on the set at least 12 hours a day. Were they long grueling days, those 10 days to shoot it? They were long, they were long days, but again, because of the way we were shooting and, um, and actually shooting in an abandoned police station and only being 10 days, we just, you, you're so immersed in it. Like I think that set more than anything I've worked on felt like we were actually there. Like it was really happening more than anything I've worked on. It, it, again, just like how it came off in the movie, it felt like very, very little separation between reality and, and that world, um, that, that, you know, supernatural world. So it didn't feel grueling. It felt just immersed. It, 
scary almost be present and very scary yeah <laughs> which leads me to my next question i wanted to ask this question to uh a, you know an actor who's been in a great paranormal film like last shift when you're in those intense scenes for example when you're locked in that cell in the dark and you're just petrified you're a cop you're trying to play it cool but yet we could see how scared uh jessica is in her eyes as an actress what do you do to find that fear and portray it to us as the audience mm. I just used my imagination. It was it was pretty easy to do in that film because all the lights would be off. You would be in an enclosed cell with like a person in terrifying makeup in the dark right in front of you. And I mean, I just sort of allowed myself to be right where I was and thought like, okay, so this is actually happening, but like just put yourself in this space where there's no way out. Like there's no one's calling cut at the end of this right. and just let it be and it was pretty easy to do again because the situation that you know we filmed in was so realistic <laughs> was it anybody was scared. On I was scared the... legitimately I, I can i can imagine that was a, <laughs> a, a, a that must have been a pretty damn creepy building did any of the crew or you know try to prank you at all or even joshua <laughs> who was there try to keep the you know mood a little bit light or anything uh so break from the intensity of the film I don't. I don't think we had time. <laughs> <laughs> I think. I think all we did was shoot and sleep. Um, no, I. I can't recall. I mean, Anthony, as it is, has such a light heart. It was I, ironically, it was a really fun set because um, Anthony is so lighthearted. He's hilarious. He jokes around a lot, just in general. Um, I mean, there were. You know, like we had a joke, an ongoing joke about how my bun, I think it started off as a bun and turned into a ponytail, just got bigger and bigger. Like every every scene, like the frame was a little more full of my bun. <laughs> and so there were things on set that like kept it light. That's so cool. Now, like I said <laughs> earlier, you have a very diverse resume between TV, film. You're not a particular uh, locked into any genre where you say you could, you've done more horror than this or anything else but is there any genre that you specifically like uh working on more than another i i do love horror and i want to do more of it i think the problem is well not the problem but like what makes it difficult is finding good horror films that are like really like just great quality great story like you know there are a lot of them out there but they're also you know it can be easy to fall into like kind of I don't know, a cheesy horror movie yeah. zone. Um, so like really good horror movies, like, you know, the Shining level yeah. horror movie. I'm into that. And then also comedy. I I love doing comedy and I would I haven't done enough of it. I haven't done as much as I, I wish. Um, but yeah, comedy is also the majority of what I write. So uh, tell us more about your writing uh i mean is writing something going down further into your career that you want to do more of or is being in front of the camera where your passion truly lies you know it's both i think as a really really little girl like three i started writing um stories or and you know dictating stories that like my my parents would write down and uh then very shortly thereafter because i'm also from new york we, you were mentioning you were too mm -hmm. uh, so I was going to plays a lot as a little kid. And so very shortly after I started writing, I started going to plays and the two, I would write stories for myself to act out. And um, so the two have always gone hand in hand. And now I've always written, but especially since COVID, I have felt really called to just write roles um, for myself and stories for everyone. Cause we, we need them. We need to be entertained. We need to be, um, you know, distracted from what's yeah. happening and informed and uh it's just a really good time to, to create content now you are a graduate of nyu tish school of the arts of i know very hard school to get into the best mm -hmm. school in the country when it mm -hmm. comes to film whether you want to be an editor all the way to acting i mean it's, it's just one of the best film schools and hardest schools to get into so congratulations on getting it to NYU. 
Did you find that after gradu graduating from NYU, uh, having Tish uh, as part of your education really helped you start your career? So, yes, yes. I mean, just yes. The level of training uh, that you get at that school is unbelievable. You take, I mean, not only acting, but voice and diction movement. You take mask class where you, this, um, the teacher, his name was Pear, and he had all of these masks from all over the world. And you just, you know, you put them on in, during each class and just see what it makes your body do. Like you feel the energy. I mean, things like that, you just, Nowhere else, I, I don't think anywhere else in the world could you get that deep a level of training. Um, even yoga, like it was part of the curriculum at NYU. Um, so it definitely put me in a zone of, um, first of all, being better trained, but also taking it more seriously, realizing how much of my instruments I really did need. Um, and yeah, I'm so, so grateful for NYU. And uh, a lot of people who are not familiar with NYU. Isn't it the coolest thing to have Greenwich Village as your campus? It's so fun. <laughs> it's so fun. I got in a lot of trouble. Washington Square <laughs> Park was my biggest. I even though I did not attend NYU, I that's that was our spot. Me and my friends, we would always hang out at Washington Square Park in Greenwich Village. So yeah. even though I never went to NYU, I felt like I, I should be made like an honorable alumni or something. <laughs> Honestly, I think I spent uh, a couple, you know, I think I spent some more time in that park than I did in my classroom. Yeah. My <laughs> it's fun. It's completely, I don't know, it's, it's a totally different experience. Now, you come from a family that has deep roots in the arts. Um, mm -hmm. So how young were you when you realized that you wanted to be an actress? Uh, do, is it as far back as you can remember? It is. I since I was, I knew for sure at five uh, again because my parents started taking me to plays really early. And the first play I saw was a Secret Garden, and it starts off with a girl who's also about five, just on this swing um, that was going back and forth over the over the audience and back onto the stage with this like beautiful, you know, like unbelievably made set of a garden behind her. And I just remember like looking at her and thinking, that's what I want to do, that's what I want to be, and I don't ever want to do anything else. And, and somehow it just never changed. So um, it was forever. Um, I started taking acting class when I was six and then moved to L.A. when I was uh, nine. And the rule was no agents. My, my parents were like, you're too young, you shouldn't be in that business. But in L.A., they scout you out. They mm -hmm. Like they go to the acting classes and scout you out. So an agent did that. And uh, my mom felt too bad to say no because she knew it was my dream. So <laughs> I that's started. A good, that's a very cool mom. Uh, you yeah, go. it was. It was really it was really cool. Um, you know, I don't know if I could do it for my kid, honestly, at, at that age. And she didn't know this going. Well, she did because that's why she said no initially. But it's, it's hard for a kid. Um, and especially back then, I feel like, more so than now, there was this obsession with like being skinny and in uh, in the industry. Now that. it's changing. You remember it was like really sick, that. and it, it was many many years uh, until recently. Mm -hmm. um, so like I remember being, you know, um, I think I was eleven. I was getting some headshots done, and like, the photographer grabbed my thigh, and she was like, "You're going to be so successful, and you just need to get rid of this." And she like shook the fat on my thigh, and she said, "You know, and you'll just you'll make it. You'll be great." And like that stayed with me forever. So I really learned how to toughen up. I learned how to like, I need to really have a lot of self uh, love and a lot of self confidence and a thick skin. And I learned that at a really early age from this business. As a parent myself, you know, I've thought of this myself. I mean, how do you teach your kid at such a young age about rejection and learning mm -hmm. how to take rejection? It's like, you want to build up your kid's confidence and it's just acting and child actors and what they have to go through. I can understand any parents, uh, you know, hesitation and wanting to protect their child from it, but I'm glad everything worked out very well for you. Now, around the same time, let me ask you this. Did you shoot your two episodes of The Walking Dead before or after Last Shift? 
that was the oh my god i can't even remember i think it was because they came out really close together it was before i'm pretty sure yeah i think it was before and it was close together i think that's why i'm having a hard time remembering so you get you book the walking dead uh you know, it's the mid-season, season four. It, the show is starting to cement itself into this mega franchise that it's about to become. Give us your first impressions in Georgia when you walk onto the Walking Dead set. I was so scared. <laughs> I was, I'd never done anything so big. And much like the last shift set on a much bigger scale, everything looked real. Like they, they've transformed mm -hmm. all of Peachtree City to look like The Walking Dead. And it just, it's, it's overwhelming in an amazing way. Um, I remember being just overcome. Like it was, it was so much fun. It felt like being on, it was, it felt, I think it was the biggest set I've been on to this day. Uh, and I was just so excited. It felt like a dream coming true. And um, to be part of the franchise like that, just, it was one of those like pinch me moments. Now, uh, I mean, obviously you were aware of The Walking Dead. It doesn't really ma matter if you were following the show or not. But once you got the part and you realized that you're going to be a part of two of some of the most famous episodes. It's when one of them is where we lost Herschel, Scott Wilson. He got killed off. Do you remember uh, who your first scene with, was with? Was it with Tara, played by Alana Masterson? Was it with David Morrissey, who was the governor? Who was your first scene with on The Walking Dead? It was with Alana and with Audrey Marie Anderson. Uh, and it was the scene where um, I, Alana was, or no, Audrey was patching up my hand. I got, mm -hmm. I cut my hand. And, um, oh my God, I remember <laughs> it was, I was so nervous anyway. And then they put the most realistic looking cut on my hand. And I'm actually really squeamish with blood, which, you know, like I've been challenged doing horror movies and stuff with this. And I remember getting really lightheaded and thinking like, oh, my God, if I pass out at my first day at work because of a fake cut, like I'm never going to live this down. <laughs> but I just drank a lot of water. I kept it together. So that <laughs> mid-season finale, when the governor finally brings down the prison, let me ask you this question first. Uh in your opinion, what makes the governor's character brilliantly played by David Morrissey? So uh, why does he get so many people to follow him? You think it's just the, the charm of a psychopath who knows how to use his charm to manipulate people? Definitely, definitely. And I, and I think because his, his um, anger and his darkness is rooted in pain that he suffered himself and he had been through trauma himself that there's an element i think the best heroes or um, the best villains have an element of you have an element of sympathy for them like there's a vulnerability there there's something soft about them that endears you to them and even in his psychotic like craziness there is a softness and a hurt and a vulnerability that he just portrays like he said very brilliantly uh, uh, and it endears people to him. So that that again, that finale. Uh, I know that you they get like ten, twelve days to shoot mid season and finales and premieres and so on. Walk us through how that set was during the filming of that finale. Uh, it was a crazy episode to watch on TV. How was it behind the scenes? Was it chaotic? Was there just craziness all around? Uh, it was going to be Scott Wilson's last episode. Walk us through those couple of days of shooting that finale. Well, everybody on the set of Walking Dead is the ultimate professional. I mean, they just know what they're doing. There's no sense of uh, panic or chaos. And that's on many sets, uh, even on big projects, you you often get vibes of like panic for a big thing, like a, like a finale. And everybody was very calm. Everything is very well planned out. I think it has to be to run a production of that size and caliber. Um, and it was 
it we were literally going to war and it was like done with the precision of army generals like putting people like in their ranks in their right spots and it was i mean very um everything was very clean and and simple but done on the hugest most epic scale i mean we were walking through fields with tanks and guns actually firing i mean it was crazy it felt, yeah it was that part was crazy and then it was also quite emotional for the cast that had been with scott for such a long time to say goodbye it's the hardest it's the hardest thing to get through an episode and and like not cry when you're not supposed to cry knowing that you're about to say goodbye to someone you love so much and my heart was breaking for them because they were all having a hard time just getting through the week yes yes now um when you got that part as alicia on the walking dead uh was the audition just uh you know pretty not i don't want to say easy but did you have to do a lot of callbacks or how did the audition process shape out for the walking dead that was a cool one because I had I had just gone to New Mexico to visit my family and uh, I got the call for the audition. They said, you can do it as a self-tape. They know that you're out of town. So I just sat in my mom's dining room and read it with her on my really bad phone. I don't remember if it was a Blackberry or what. It was an old blurry phone. Um, and I just did the audition like that. And the next day they said, okay, like leave your parents' house. You have to come to Georgia. And no call back, no nothing. It was wow. just yeah you must have really nailed it on that tape uh yeah now I, now when you get the script and you find out you know your character is going to be an lgbt character with uh involved with alana masterson the walking dead has done a great job uh with the lgbt community so kudos to them how did yeah. you feel being a part of that you know in that about taking part in that in the walking dead and, um, you know, every character in the LGBT community who's a fan of The Walking Dead really applauds. And even, you know, people that are not in the LGBT community, I applaud them for being so willing to bring that to the screen. And I would say over the last 11 years, The Walking Dead has sort of revolutionized television in regards to its diversity. How did you feel reading the script as you being an LGBT character on The Walking Dead? I was so happy to to uh, to play an LGBTQ character because I hadn't uh, before. And I just think that as far as the stories that we tell, representation is everything. People have to see themselves represented. And I was also, because again, it was one of those things that like back in the day, you didn't see like even like super multi-ethnic casts in the way that you do now. It's, um, it was a different time even back then and it wasn't so long ago. So I felt almost a sense of relief. Like, thank God, like we're, there's progress here. Like we're moving forward, we're telling, you know everybody's story i was i was really thrilled to uh play that character and that they they made that choice for her now the walking dead is a lot of shows but they're ultra secretive when you audition you get sides you don't really know what you're auditioning for what did you, what was your initial thoughts of the character alicia that you were going to play did you like this character let me put it to you this way alicia is classified as an antagonist I'm not really sure about that. Do you agree that she's an antagonist or somebody who was very manipulated? Yeah, no, I don't. I don't find her. I don't think of her at all as an antagonist. Yeah, exactly. Just the opposite. Somebody who was manipulated and uh, who got in with the wrong crowd with good intention. You know, I think that if she knew what the government, the government, what the governor was doing and what he was capable of, um, she would not have stayed with him. Uh, and she didn't get the chance to find out. Unfortunately, her story got cut short. But uh, no, I don't think that she would have ever done anything to hurt. She thought that she was attacking bad people. Because that's, that's what she was told. I remember that scene once the fighting had begun and Alana is just uh, basically crotched down, you know, on her butt, covering her ears. And you come to her and you basically tell her to keep her head down, uh, you know, or fight, you, even though there was a war breaking out around you, you really had feelings uh, for Tara, 
Alicia had, you know, real emotional feelings and possibly love. You guys were not together for that long, but you could say you loved and you definitely cared about each other. Uh, what do you think about that interaction between Alicia and Tara as the fighting was breaking out around you guys? That was my favorite scene to shoot, just that little that little piece with Alana because it really showed depth and it really showed, you know, not just Alicia's story, but all of these characters, like in the midst of all of this war and death and chaos, like they're people and they ha they love and like they, you know, they're not able to have normal relationships. They're not able to like fully express this love because of this, this devastating world that they're in. Um, and I just, I loved the juxtaposition of that scene in that, uh, within that scene. Yeah. And um, uh, it was, it was really beautiful. And I did feel in that moment, her love for, um, for Tara. Now you had also mentioned in a prior uh, interview, I believe that the walking dead was a major milestone uh, for you. How would you say the walking dead prepared you for arrow? If it did in any way, what did you learn from the walking dead that you took forward with you in your career? If the last shift came afterwards to that all the way to arrow. I, I think I learned how to be on a big set uh, of a franchise that's very successful and um, how, as you know, I wasn't a lead on the walking dead, but I got to, I got to watch how the leads, treated uh you know like co-stars and guest stars and and background actors and um i learned that you have to compose yourself in like a certain way well you don't have to a lot of a lot of actors don't but um that, that was the nicest nicest set i had ever been on. i mean they were so kind so welcoming like just you know walk in the day you're getting your makeup done and like shake your hand and welcome we're so happy to have you with like and and that makes such a difference in your experience on set and um, the cast of Walking Dead treated everyone that way. So when I went on to Arrow as one of the leads, I carried that with me and I remembered how it made me feel, you know, to have my hands shaken by, you know, all of the, all of the actors that were staples on the show. And um, you paid it forward. I paid it forward. Yeah. And, and they were already doing that honestly on the Arrow set, but I, I knew how to do it because of Walking Dead. That is so. That's a that's such a cool story. Now moving forward again in your career, having done, having been a lead in a very successful TV show, uh, would you do that again? Would you want to be uh, committed to a long term character, or do you want to have the freedom to explore different characters uh, as often as you would like? Basically, what I'm asking is. If Arrow, something similar to Arrow were to happen again, yeah, it's job security. It's great, you know? Uh, I mean, who would not like that? But do you like the option of being free to explore different characters and to see what what more you're capable of? You know, it's a really good question. I think at, at this point, I can say that as an actor, you you know that no matter what the job is, no matter how long it goes on for, there's always an end, and you're always going to play another character. I guess if you're lucky, yeah. um, but there's always going to be an end. And looking back now, like I just wish I could have one more day with Dinah, even after you know four plus years with her, and I miss her. Um, and it's exciting to play other characters now, to audition for other characters, but. Um, I'm just happy, like however long something is supposed to live for, I believe that that's exactly as it's meant to be. And I, I would be happy to play a role for, you know, another four years or five years. I would be happy to play a role for two to three days. Um, you just have to kind of, you have to fall in love with all of it. Mm -hmm. So what's in store for you? Is there any projects that you're working on currently that you can say at least that you are working on something or you're auditioning? What's in store for you for right now? Yeah, um, so I'm, I've been recently auditioning more and um, and going to shoot a movie in a few day or in a week or so, going to New York um, to shoot a Christmas movie, actually. So totally different <laughs> vibe. <laughs> um, but that's that's the fun of it, you know. It's like 
I don't I don't know how much I can say about it, so I'm gonna just err on the side of that's caution. Fine, but, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, like Christmas movie, so it's awesome. It's you know great to switch things up from uh, crime fighting vigilante to you know Coco and Carols. <laughs> <laughs> now you said you're a horror fan. Is there any uh, you know we're would you say you've been a horror fan all your life or when do you think you became a horror fan? Very young, very young. I was always into like the macabre and, and dark things. And even when I was really young, you know, I loved the Adams family and I kind of started there. And then also at a pretty young age, I saw, you know, the exorcist, the shining Rosemary's baby, like all, kind of all the classics. And, um, I just loved how they made me feel. I love how the, the suspense and I love the quiet. I love that in horror movies, there's so much, so many moments of just quiet, um, in any film. I'm, I like that. So, um, yeah, it just, there's something about the genre that really draws me in. As a horror fan, when you saw the, uh, when you saw last shift, all done, ready to be viewed by the audience, what were your feelings on the movie? Not as, being an actor in it, but as the movie itself. I mean, it's a great movie. I just want to hear what your thoughts on the movie were. Honestly, I it ended and I thought, wow, that was really good. And I was just really happy and really relieved because a lot of times you shoot something and you're like, this is going to be great. And then you watch it back and you're like, that was like the biggest piece of crap. So <laughs> I, I, I was really pleased. Again, it's just Anthony is he he couldn't do he couldn't do wrong with anything that he creates i asked anthony was there any particular challenging scene and he said that chair scene he said he, <laughs> he ne- that they, he, he never got it right i mean according to him he just it never if i remember his words correctly he never finished it the way wow. he wanted that see that that chair scene to go it came out great as far as us the viewers go yeah. Now, do you think uh, if you were to put yourself in uh, Officer Cohen's situation, so if Juliana was actually in Officer Cohen's situation, do you think she would have uh, made it through the night? I, you can't say that Jessica had a happy ending. No. Uh, I think she got exactly what the payments had planned for her, is what ultimately happened to her. But do you think you would have lasted as long as she did? I um, I definitely would have made it through the night because the second something weird happened, I would have left. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you on I'm with you on that one. She's I, much braver. I mean, I mean, it's a movie where you really don't know who's real and who's fake. You're having a conversation with who you think is another cop until he turns around and you see he's got a big hole in the back of his head. And it's a world where you don't know what's real and what's fake. Uh, I made the assumption, but did you feel that the payment's ultimate goal was to kill Jessica or just to make her go crazy and hallucinate and start shooting those innocent people like she did at the end of the movie? What do you think their goal was? I I think their ultimate goal was to get her to, you know, ultimately kill her and have her join them. I think, you know, he's the leader of a cult. And so, yeah, he thrives on the chaos. He thrives on, like, preying on innocent people and, you know, and making her hallucinate. I think it's fun for them. But I also think that their whole point is that they want to keep growing and recruiting. And for that... I think there could be a really, really cool sequel. I told that to Anthony too, and I even mentioned the prequel where we actually find out what this cult was like before they committed suicide at that police station. That, That's awesome. That would be a good story as well. Anyway, That's Juliana, awesome. we are almost out of time. I want to thank you so much for doing this and sharing all your great stories. Looking back on Arrow, you got an opportunity that actors would kill to have in being a part of that franchise for four seasons. You did like 67 episodes. That's crazy as one character. What Walking away from Arrow, what is the moment that really you cherish the most on that set? 
Wow. I mean, I'm sure there must be a lot of stuff that happened that's going to stay with you forever. But is there anything that really just is seared into your memory that holds a special place in your heart? I think the first and the last days, the first day when I walked in and again, just absolutely terrified, had no idea what I was doing. And, and Stephen and Mel walked in and we were in, um, I don't know if it was like a, it was something, there was something to do with pigs. It stunk. It was, it was gross. And then he just walked in and we laughed about it and he gave me the biggest hug and welcomed me so warmly. And I, again, just sort of felt my life changing in that moment. And then again, like <laughs> jump, you know, four years later, when we were all together uh, in the bunker for the last time and literally turning the lights off in the scene and saying goodbye, like the first moment and everything in between up until then just kind of flashed in front of me. And I, it was a very profound um, and kind of surreal feeling. And we were crying so much. I felt so much love and um, it was, it was really, really special. It sounds special. Uh, like I said, there are, actors out there who would love to have done what you did and that's something you just it's so rare and you did a great job congratulations you're part of the dc universe uh thank you so much for joining us it's been an absolute honor to talk to you thank you for sharing your stories like i said you have one of the most diverse resumes i've seen in a while you're not you've done a little bit of everything uh, do you have any, I know I keep saying this is the last question. I promise this is the last question, <laughs> okay, but, I can keep... <laughs> but do you, uh, do, where does theater sit in your heart? Do you want to do theater? Are you interested in theater? Uh, does that, is that something you're willing to do or try moving forward? Absolutely. You know, when I was younger, I did a lot of theater and that was where my love for acting started. And I would be so happy to do more theater, um, even even small, you know, like community theater. I love I love tiny little productions in in small, you know, on small stages. I think it's so personal and and powerful. And um, so in the future, I really do hope that there is more theater. I think one of, and it's so unfortunate, but uh, one of the very few downsides of acting, solely acting as a profession, um, as opposed to like acting and something else, which I did for many years and a lot of actors do, mm -hmm. is that to make money, um, theater isn't always, unless you're doing Broadway, theater isn't always Enough. the easiest yeah. to make money. Yeah. So I think, so sad to say that, but I think that is a big part of the reason that as an adult, I just haven't been doing as much theater. Okay, that's totally but, fair. Uh, yeah, but I, I think now with COVID and, you know, it's, they're going to be, like we were saying about streaming and, you know, there's new, we're finding new ways to create. And I think there will be ways to, you know, look, stream a play. Like, I think more things will become possible. That'd be very interesting. Uh, yeah. That'd be very, very interesting. Can you imagine if you have, like, a Broadway show like Hamilton? I mean, uh, that was sold out for a year in advance to be able to watch it from your home? That is a cool concept. It is a cool concept. I actually, I'm, I, wow, I'm really glad we just discussed that. That's really great. That, yeah, yeah. That, that, that never actually crossed my mind until you just said that. Uh, yeah. Anyway, thank you so much, Julian. It's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, treat talking to you i want to thank all of our viewers any final thoughts you want to share with your fans or our audience tonight before we go uh, i just want to thank you guys so much you are the best most supportive most loving fans you have made this whole experience even more magical and i, I it wouldn't have happened without you and um i just want to say how much i love and appreciate you and i'm so so grateful for all of your support that's awesome. Thank you so much. I want to thank all of our viewers for tuning in. Thank you again to Juliana. We'll be back on the air on Thursday. Until then, guys, on behalf of Juliana and myself, stay safe. Stay walking. Good night.